All right, welcome back to another episode of the Hard Sell Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Stevenson, and another fantastic guest again this week. Uh, Austin Ball is a director at uh, TD Securities and the Communications Media and Technology Investment Banking team. Prior to that, Austin was at Jefferies, uh, also doing investment banking, and uh, has been at this for a while, has done a lot of deals, I think over $20 billion uh, worth of deals, uh, including uh, the Yesware deal that uh, that he and I worked on together. So I thought uh, it'd be fun to have Austin on the podcast uh, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, selling in, in the investment banking context. So uh, Austin, welcome to the hard sell. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Good morning. It's uh, really good to be here and uh, agree. You've uh, you've got a great team and it was uh, it was a pleasure working with you and, uh, and the team last year. Well, maybe it's for folks that aren't as familiar. I mean, I think everybody knows uh, Probably everybody knows who TD Bank is. Um, at least if you live here in Boston, you've probably been to the TD Garden. But uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about the the investment banking side and and what you're focused on there. Yeah, absolutely. Would would love to. And thanks for the opportunity. That's right. I think uh, traditionally, uh, folks here, at least on on the East Coast, uh, the United States, um, you know, see TD uh, Bank, right? The, the 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 big green bank that's on many corners and in, in cities uh, up and down the East Coast. Um, I'm on. I work for TD Securities, which is uh, the capital markets and investment banking part of of TD Bank, um, and um, that is a leading full service uh, investment bank. So, 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 what does that mean? So, we provide services like mergers and acquisitions, equity and debt capital markets, private capital. Uh, solutions, uh, corporate banking, leveraged finance, uh, global transaction bankings. We've got a really good ESG solutions team. Uh, we're a global market maker. We've got equity research. And we do all of this across a wide range of, uh, of industry coverage. So I myself sit in the technology group. I cover software companies, enterprise software companies. Um, but we do what I do uh, across many groups like chemicals and energy and healthcare, industrials and real estate. So uh, it truly is a full service bank. And we utilize, uh, you know, the, the broader bank. We are the fifth largest bank in North America on any given day um, to, to do a lot of what we do. We recently, um, on March 1st, 2023, uh, close the acquisition of Cowan, uh, which has created a larger and more integrated investment banking platform uh, for us across all of the, uh, you know, products that I uh, that I said: capital markets, M and A, research, equities, uh, you know, and banking. And so, uh, since coming over from Jefferies, which is effectively where I grew up, uh, you know, three three years ago. Um, we, we are real. Everyone is doing a really nice job of scaling this bank up and um, uh, and winning. So it's it's a good story, and 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 you know we we really appreciative of you and uh, and your board trusting us uh, to 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 sell uh, Yesware last year. Yeah, it was uh, it was uh, definitely an interesting and, and fun experience, which I'm sure uh, we'll talk a little bit more as we get into this. Um, and so I, I thought it'd be interesting to, de to delve a little bit into this. Um, I mean, many of the listeners are are familiar with with how investment banking works, um, but you know, for those that maybe aren't quite as familiar, you know, like fundamentally, you know, a, uh, you know, I would say like a person like you, Austin, like your job is to is to sort of you know help companies uh, get acquired and or help uh, other companies acquire companies. Like you're you're you are a deal maker uh, in, in some sense. And, uh, you know, a lot of the listeners are, are normally selling the same thing, whether it's a product or a service or, you know, maybe you're you're just getting started on your company and you're, you're, you're maybe you're not even sure whether it, it, it is a product or a service. But in your case, but you but in general, you're selling more or less the same thing um, over and over again. And in your case, every every company is a little bit different. And so I'm curious um you know, maybe just talk to us a little bit about like, what are the things that are the same in that process? And what are the things that, you know, you, you have to kind of redo every single time because every company is, uh, is unique. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's right. I think, um, you know, the product is always different, right? I mean, no, no two companies, um, you know, are the same, right. And, I, and, and what's best for one company who's at a certain stage, of its life cycle um, is not as best, you know, for another who's at the same stage or, you know, could be a difference. So, 
um, you know, we help companies, you know, transact. We help parties access capital, both in the public and private markets. Uh, we help them transact, sell themselves or buy other companies. Um, and so, you know, for what's the same, for example, on an M&A process, regardless of, uh, you know, size of company, uh, tenure of business is really a lot of the, um, you know, is really a lot of the procedural stuff um is what i'd say right and so from a procedural process um you're going to have a lot of things that look exactly the same um so most m a processes from that standpoint are, are similar every m a process um you know involves a pre-marketing phase so this is you know we can get into in a, in a little bit if you'd like joel kind of the sale process from like a, a banker funnel perspective but I'm, I'm talking from a after we've you know signed up a, a company to take them to market and sell themselves um that those procedures tend to be you know somewhat similar we've got a pre-marketing phase right that is where um uh you know the bankers work with the c-suite oftentimes the ceo the cfo perhaps one or two other uh, you know, key uh, business folks at a business around preparing the company. It also, it, it would typically involve, you know, presentation creation, uh, you know, building a financial model, uh, you know, for, um, you know, for the client. That's one phase that typically is part of every deal. Then within, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, process launch and formal marketing, when the business officially gets taken to market, you're called out in market. Uh, that is when you're dialoguing with potential parties that are going to uh, potentially ac acquire you. Those things involve meetings with management. Uh, you know, in, in the pandemic, a lot of these were done virtually. Um, and you, you you frequently had deals being done with management teams that had never um, or, or investors that really had never spent much time together in person, which is is um, is is very atypical. We've gotten back to uh, obviously in the last year and a half uh, or so, you know, in person management meetings, and 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 that's very very important. It's typically a three or four hour uh, you know presentation uh, that that the client that's for sale provides to a potential. Uh, you know, corporate, uh, that's a suitor or a private equity or, uh, you know, other buyer. Um, another part of the process that's pretty procedural is, uh, you know, the, the, the formalizing of, you know, letters of interest and, you know, documentation around those. There's typically a date kind of, you know, drawn in the sand where folks have to provide interest, you know, by, and that sort of catalyzes the rest of your process, which is around, you know, diligence, um, and then formally documenting, uh, uh, you know, merger agreements or joint stock agreements, et cetera. So those procedural steps, those four or five, really don't change. Um, what does change and what's different is really the, you know, is the fun part for, you know, a banker is, is really all the nuances of each company um, at the particular time of sale that form the narrative for the business when it goes to market or launches a sale process, right? Um, you know, the, the business could be at hyper growth, the business could be not growing, um, uh, the business could have uh, momentum with new customers in a new segment, or it could be, you know, churning customers, right? And so a lot of things that a lot of the items that dictate the narrative, or some of these, you know, uh, uh, you know, le level two, three, four, five, you know, pieces of information on a business uh, that the bankers along with, um, you know, the, the, the company, uh, you know, need to address. And you typically try to address those, uh, you know, pre, uh, that's why during your pre-marketing phase, uh, but, you know, the, the, so you get all the skeletons out of the closet before, you know, it gets disclosed to, uh, you know, potential buyers. But I can't remember a single deal where that's ever, you know, that's not had a had, had a had a speed bump, right? There's just certain uncontrollable, you know, events that um, uh, that just that just that just pop up, right? I mean, there's things where, you know, we've had clients that have lost, you know, believe it or not, their number one customer, you know, in the middle of a process, right? You're talking about a large, you know, three year, uh, you know, account. Um, We've had uh, clients that have been involved in, you know, litigations and, you know, it's it's tough to, you know, circle value for a company that has an unknown liability. And so, um, you know, there's things that tend to pop up on any process. I'm sure any banker would tell you that. So there's a lot of things that are very similar uh, on each process, no matter whether you're selling a, you know, pencil company or whether you're selling a software company, but it's just these nuances 
um, that tend to make uh, the processes obviously more dynamic. And and that's what, you know, that, that's what makes things fun. And, and Joel, we saw that. I, I'd be curious to get your point of view. We saw a little bit of that, right? We, we were in market with Yesware sort of um, in the middle of the SaaS drawdown, kind of in early 22, right? And so these were businesses where, and I'm you know talking generally now, you have businesses where bankers were spending a lot of time with businesses whose, whose investors were telling them, um, you know, to, to grow, uh, to grow at all costs. Right. And then very quickly last year, um, you had a shift in mindset, uh, of the buyers to sort of, you know, profitable growth and balanced growth. And, um, some of the most scaling software businesses, both public and private, um, you know, were told to, you know, shift focus. And so that's played, that's played a big role, frankly, in, um, you know, in, in, in the process, in a lot of process and a lot of MA processes, the last, uh, the last 18 months. So, so Joel, I mean, my, my question, um, you know, that I had for you around some of these nuances and what's act, what's actually, you know, different on, you know, these processes, not only are the companies different, but the nuances of different timing is different. The markets are different, right. Um, you know, in any given process and the yes, we experience was, you know, an example where, um, you know, we were in market, you know, during a time when there was a shift of investor sentiment, right? For so long, technology businesses and software executives, you know, specifically were being told to grow at all costs. And, you know, sort of right in front of, uh, you know, our eyes, uh, there was a shift in sentiment to, you know, balanced growth or profitable growth. And whether you uh, were a public company that was, um, you know, trading on revenue, um, uh, or whether you were a private company that uh, was unprofitable, it really affected um, uh, both public and private sentiment from a seller and buyer perspective. So I'd be curious to hear, um, you know, your quick thoughts on, on you know, on, on that. Yeah, well, I think, you know, one of the things that we benefited from was the fact that we were already, we had already sort of gotten fit, if you will, and we never... I mean, at least as long as I, I think I was like part of what, you know, I ended up doing um, as I as I took over as CEO was we, we became just a little bit more efficient um, in a bunch of different areas. And so we were maybe a little bit ahead of the curve uh, on 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 some of those things with, you know, our discipline around, you know, return on ad spend and overhead and some of this other stuff. And, and actually, in some ways, I regret it because, uh, you know, I almost wonder in hindsight if if I actually could have just put the pedal down, like it never made sense to me to do that because just from like a pure long-term economic shareholder value perspective, like I couldn't wrap my head around that, but there was a certain aspect where people that were doing that, you know, were getting very large checks written to them. And then, you know, maybe we could have used that very large check to go do some other, you know, set of interesting things. So that, that's, that is something that uh, I, 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 I do spend some time um, thinking about, but, but anyway, but it, it certainly benefited us, I think in the sale it process did. that we were sort of showing up as a little bit more efficient. Yeah. And when you, you think about, you know, I always try to, um, you know, selling software businesses, I think, you know, it, it, and part of the unique thing about being on this show is I think, you know, from a funnel perspective, I think, you know, software quota carrying sales reps, it's that people probably, you know, those folks don't probably think, um, very similarly to me in some cases, when we think about funnel and activity and, uh, you know, time to close, right? All that stuff, you know, matters. What I've noticed um, in my practice, and I, I think I'm speaking for a lot of folks, is that, you know, your typical M&A process and, um, you know, in terms of timeline uh, for a private company, you know, sale is, is, is probably anywhere from, you know, four to five months on the on the short end right now. And I think what we've seen from a, a you know funnel perspective is just processes um, in general taking uh, you know a little bit longer in some cases a lot longer uh, to to transact and I think it's on a few fronts you know a lot of those you know reasons um, are because of you know investors that you know have become a little skittish with just public markets and wanting to check a lot more boxes you know today than they necessarily did and you know, in 2020 and 2021, when it feels like everything was just kind of, you know, riding a wave of of momentum. So, you know, I agree. And, and a lot of the businesses that we're spending time with now who, um, 
you know, have that right mix of, you know, moderate growth to high growth with, you know, uh, profitability are actually the ones that are benefiting. I don't know if we'll see from a sales funnel perspective, um, you know, the IPO markets open and, and, and a lot of, you know, it's going to take a really big, uh, you know, company with a lot of, and I'm talking specifically in software with a lot of revenue, it's very profitable, maybe open up those windows more broadly, but you're starting to see it on the new issuance front over the last few weeks. There's been a couple, uh, but I wouldn't say it's a barometer for, for anything yet. Yeah. 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 We, we like to, I mean, we have a phrase over here that I don't think it's unique to us, but you know, time kills deals. Uh, so yeah. we, we generally yeah. find that the longer something drags out, the long, you know, the more things can go wrong, you know, executive gets replaced, the budget, 100%. The budget, you know, there's just, there's just all kinds of stuff. And I think from a, you know, from a company sale perspective, there, you know, there are any number of, I mean, you could have issues with the acquiring company and, and a lot of, we, you know, in our case, we actually told everybody that the plan was to uh, try to find a strategic buyer of the company. But I know from conversations I've had with many others that have gone through this process, a lot of times people don't say that because they're worried about destabilizing the business. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we've lucked out here that we had we had always been pretty upfront with folks and the folks that were left were sort of, you know, uh, maybe, you know, up for anything or had a very sort of, uh, you know, mature uh, point of view about about what was going to happen. Uh, yeah. But that but that can definitely, it, you know, the longer, especially if you're keeping it secret, the longer it goes, the harder it is to sort of keep it that way. Yeah. And uh, then, you know, that things start to leak and people start to, you know, you, you lose trust or you lose focus. Uh, there's, you know, a, a hundred probably bad things that could happen. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, um, we see it on every deal. I mean, momentum is everything. Uh, and not only externally, right, when you're talking to businesses, right, you want to have your touch points as you're bringing buyers through the funnel, right? You want to have your touch points. You want to make sure you're being super responsive. We can get into maybe some of the deadlines and why everything in banking is so time sensitive and critical. Um, momentum is everything and part of a process externally when you're in when you're in market, when one's in market, it's also, you know, uh, momentum is a lot, is a lot internally too, right? You want to make sure that your base of employees, you know, if they are aware of any process, um, you know, is going to have a really good home. These are people that, um, you know, have really, uh, and this is the, you know, the, the human side of kind of what, you know, I do. And, and as we bring companies kind of through, you know, the sales funnel is part of an M&A process. I mean, oftentimes, you know, number, you know, numbers are discussed, right? If a strategic business is buying another strategic business, right? A company's buying another company. Uh, there are things called synergies. And oftentimes that comes in the form of, you know, people losing, you know, their jobs, which is always mm -hmm. the, you know, the crappy part of, uh, you know, of, of, of the process, you know, from my standpoint, uh, you, you love to hear a deals that have a ton of revenue synergies and, and hardly any, you know, cost takeout, but that's, that's not always the case. And so momentum internally, making sure that your employees, um, you know, or remain driven during this process, because like I said earlier, if you churn a big account, if a big account doesn't renew or does a downsell, I mean, all this stuff, affects value, right? When you think about the key performance indicators that drive value as you're bringing a business through a sales funnel um, uh, over two quarters, right? The number one thing is, you know, did the business perform right during, you know, did you say you, you did you do what you said you were going to do um, mm -hmm. during the process, right? If, if you were closing Q1, did you beat? right did you beat on revenue did you meet expectations on profitability did you win new logos right did you have incremental ebitda did you did your gross margins increase i'm kind of hopping around but you know all these key performance indicators you know really matter what sometimes what comes up as part of our processes is when there's a couple of people at a business um that are really key to a transaction um taking place and you know most times these are ceos and cfos but they're going to be well compensated uh you know uh, you know as part of the transaction because they typically have you know equity in the company etc uh, but other key employees like uh, a controller or uh you know someone else that really um, is a stakeholder in the day-to-day -day, you know business and is helping with um you know the data and helping my team and i create things these are very important people that you don't want to hold up your funnel right as you're bringing through a deal and so incentivizing those folks is really important yeah
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that brings to mind something else, which I think is a little bit unique in your business versus, you know, for example, if I'm, if I'm out selling yes, where yes, or basically performs the same way every time, every now and then, you know, you get some weird, you know, bug or something <laughs> that comes up at, at an inopportune time, but in general, you know, yes, where always, uh, you know, it always operates the same and I can demo it. I have full control over all that stuff, but you know, in your process, you've got people involved and you know you you might put and i don't think this happened in our process but you could envision a world where a ceo maybe gets in front of another ceo and you know they don't get along or something and the ceo says something to the other one and that's yeah, it's, 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 there's a set of things that are We've somewhat you know just despite your best uh, efforts are probably outside of what you can what you can yeah. actually control yeah and listen i think you know you know i've done a handful of take private in my career, which is a public listed company gets taken private by a consortium or a private equity firm or, um, you know, those deals, you have fiduciary responsibilities to form committees and make sure that you are, um, you know, doing uh, 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 what you need to do to make sure that the best buyer was discovered and is paying the most, you know, for this asset. You have your Revlon duties, et cetera. There's things like go shot periods in the private markets. Things are a lot different. Um, you know, we've been on deals where, you know, CEOs, because of just animus relationships, don't like a person. They'll take, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, less money to not transact with that person because they don't feel like their upside is as high because of maybe some of the social and the governance, you know, mm -hmm. dynamics as part of uh, this private to private transaction. So that stuff does you know, happen. Um, it's not, it's not great when it, when it does happen. Uh, but yeah, part the, you know, every, personalities do get in the way, uh, you know, from time to time. And it's part, you know, again, it's, it goes down to how does a banker, how does an investment banker bring their client through the funnel and stuff that, you know, gets addressed and, uh, you know, as part of these speed bumps that can be different from, you know, transaction to transaction. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a great yeah. point, Joel. Yeah. What, one yeah. last, Last thing um, before we wrap up here, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about um, your sort of, uh, you know, maybe like personal funnel building process in the sense that like, you know, for, you know, for software like Yesware, you know, we have people that we think are good fit accounts. We might go try to talk to those people. We do a lot of marketing that brings people into our trial process, et cetera. Uh, and in banking, it's a little bit of like there are a set of people that might be buyers and there are a set of people that might be sellers, but you never know really who is going to be who at any given time. Yeah. And so yeah. how do you try to, you know, figure out a, a way in which, you know, you, uh, Austin, at TD Bank have enough to do uh, yeah. and, and then and, but also on the flip side, not too much to do. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Good, good question. Uh, it's a, it, that's the tricky part of the job, right? I mean, so from my perspective, um, you know, the sale process for a client, right, for someone who's going to be a client or you want to be a client uh, from a bank perspective should typically start if you're if you're if if if, if this is an M&A activity, right? Capital markets, other products aside, I'm talking specifically M&A um, typically starts like two years before you're formally engaged with a banker, right? I go back to, you know, when did we meet, you know, and, and I think it was like summer of 2017 uh, when I came to Boston and 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 met you for the first time. So the M&A &A, &A is one of the longest sales cycles out there because of the required trust, expertise, capabilities, confidence that the client or the client's owners, if they're, you know, VC or PE back, like really need to have, um, you know, in its banker. And, and so like, how do you go about that, right? And so, um, you know, my job as a banker is, is to make a market for, you know, my clients and bringing buyers and sellers uh, together. And so, you know, building and maintaining that pipeline on both sides of the market is, is really, really important. Um, you know, there's only a few reasons uh, uh, why, why people get hired in my business, right? One is, you know, you're better than everyone else. Two is, um, you know, that business or their owners owe you a favor. You introduce them to other businesses. You brought a buyer to the table uh, that this, that that they didn't know or have never met. Um, you know, or three. You know, you know the buyers and the segment and have connectivity into the decision makers at these businesses, both big, small. Um, you know, uh, around the entire realm. So, you know, these are CEOs, CFOs, um, senior investors or partners um, of the owners if it's a private company. So most, most processes, most clients are one, 
for a combo of those, you know, one, two, and three, right? But it's really the connectivity to the buyers um, that is so critical, right? Being able, uh, me being able to tell a client that, you know, I, I could call the CEO or decision maker, they're a top buyer, they'll pick up my phone call, they'll give us an answer in 48 hours, I talk to them once a month, or once a quarter, we know how they behave on processes, right, because we've worked across from them in the past, we know what they're focused on today, we know what they're not focused on today. And so all this stuff is it really gives um, uh, potential clients um, confidence and they're key differentiators, right? You think you have your battle cards when you're selling against, you know, other banks and other bankers, right? Because all the good ones keep tabs on each other, right? Mm -hmm. These are key differentiators of your relationships with the buyers. And, and, and you could only do that if you continue to have these natural course dialogues with folks, right? So that's why, you know, I think yes, where was a good example, you know, we, we are talking to all of the um, largest public companies out there that are in and around the intersection of sales, marketing, uh, and customer support software and e-commerce enablement software, right? And so that that is really valuable from from you know that was really valuable from your perspective when we discussed you know process design because no one wants to waste time, right? Mm -hmm. You want to know that your banker is going to be able to get answers and that they have the rapport with the buyer that they're going to take a look at this because you know, people are busy, right? And so when they have, when you have sort of trust with your client, when you've built trust with a potential buyer party, um, you can tend to, uh, uh, you know, m make the case a little, uh, a little easier, uh, save everyone time, uh, and be taken a little bit more, uh, you know, seriously when you're, when you're in market. So I would say that's probably the main, you know, the main parts of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I would echo the trust part as being a very important currency in all these things. Uh, these are you know not necessarily easy processes to go through. You know, there's uh, there are oftentimes you know difficult or acrimonious portions of uh, negotiations involving several parties with different interests, and uh, right. it, it is good to have trust as uh, to to grease those wheels. So. Um, yeah. Well, Austin, yeah. thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Um, we could talk about this for hours, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, listeners have a, uh, you know, have, have to go close some deals or, or get some stuff done. Um, but yeah. if folks want to learn more about TD um, or, or be in touch, what are what are good ways to do that? Yeah, absolutely. If there's any, um, you know, founder, CEO, you know, uh, you know, sales leaders or investors that, you um, uh, you know, are taking in this podcast, I, you know, I'd love to talk, but, you know, I love to talk about the space. If you can't tell, I have a lot of passion uh, about, um, you know, software, emerging growth, you know, technology businesses, and we're building a practice here at TD Security. So the best way to reach out is, um, is you know, shoot me an email. My email is Austin, A-U-S-T-I-N, period, ball, B as in boy, A-L-L, -L, at TD Securities. Uh, dot com and Joel, I just want to say, you know, thanks for having me on. It's obviously been a pleasure, um, you know, establishing what I would call maybe a friendship, you know, over the last five years. And I look forward to, uh, uh, you know, staying close with you as uh, time continues to go on. And congrats on all your success. Yeah, thanks. And uh, yeah, we uh, we appreciate all the help uh, during the process. It's been good to keep in touch. And uh, yeah, I hope we uh, hope, hope we keep it going. All right, take, take care, care Joel. Yeah, bye bye.